So thank you. Let me read um, Dr. Green's uh, brief uh, biographical sketch here. Dr. Larry A. Green is a professor of history at Seton Hall University, and he has served as, as its chair. Courses include American History 1 and 2, Civil War and Reconstruction, Afro-American History 1 and 2, World War II, Re Research and Senior Seminar. As a visiting professor, he has taught African-American history to uh, 1965, 20th century Afro-American history, Southern history, history of civil rights, 1900 to 1980, Afro-American history and racial thought in America. <laughs> he received a PhD in American history from Columbia University. His dissertation was Harlem in the Great Depression. Depression. He is a recipient, a recipient of numerous honors included but not limited to Schomburg Center for Scholars in Residence mm -hmm. Program, NEH Summer Institute on Afro-American Religion, Princeton University, New Jersey, Historical Commission Grant with Lenworth Gunther for an Afro-American Curriculum Guide. And he was a Fulbright Scholar lecturing and conducting research at the University of Munster in Germany. Some of his professional appointments have included board of associates at Drew University for Holocaust Genocide Study, consultant to WNET, uh, the program A Walk Through Harlem PBS series, executive board of the New Jersey Commission, National Council on History Education, focus group reviewer of national standards for United States history, grant reviewer for the New Jersey Historical Commission, consultant to both the Union Public School System High School Studies Curriculum and the Orange New Jersey School System Workshop in Afro-American History, Specialist Reviewer for the National Endowment for the Humanity, and Advisory Reviewer of Manuscripts for the Journal of Negro History. His book publications include co-authoring with Dr. Lenworth Gunther, the New Jersey African-American History Curriculum Guide, Race, Race in the Reich, the African-American Press on Nazi Germany, a, uh, in Larry A. Green and Anke Ortlep, editors, Germans and African-Americans, two centuries of exchange, Jackson, Mississippi, University Press of Mississippi, and with John B. Duff, Slavery, Its Origins and Legacy. His book in progress is Home Front, Battlefront, New Jersey during World War II, the New Jersey Historical Commission series. Dr. Green has written over 21 articles in books and journals. Some of the journal articles include Lincoln, Slavery and Race in Civil War New Jersey, the documentary Evidence and Treatment and Film in the Journal of Rutgers University Libraries, Langston Hughes, Russia and the African American Press, in Yuri P. Trechikov and E.M. Apenko, editors, The Russian American Ties, African Americans and Russia. He has organized conferences, including being a co-founder of the Marion Thomas Wright Study, which has organized annual African American history conferences, Marion Wright, Marion Thompson Wright Lecture Series for Rutgers University, and he has presented at numerous conferences and symposiums. So without further delay, our brother, our scholar, brother, Dr. Larry Green. Thank you very much, uh, the chairman. Thank you very much, Larry. It's been a while. <laughs> I yes, miss you guys, but I've been following you, uh, all the good work you've been doing. And thank you to my fellow sister, I Ingrid Hill. Uh, for uh, extend, and you for extending the invitation to me to speak here. Um, so, you know, I thought, how am I going to talk about three, uh, about the three hundred year black presence in in in, uh, in New Jersey uh, in such a short time? But I figured that 
Uh, I think uh, with issues of reparations and slavery in the in the news, that this might be a, a good topic to talk about. Slavery, civil war, and emancipation in New Jersey. So, um, if we go to the next slide, I just want to deal with a few iconic figures, uh, African American figures uh, tied to New Jersey. One is Harriet Tubman, as you well know, an iconic figure, born into slavery, escaped slavery in Maryland, became a conductor on the Underground Railroad, led hundreds of, uh, to freedom um, on routes that often led through New Jersey, through Southern New Jersey, and uh, uh, prior to the Civil War. And during the Civil War, was involved in, um, uh, in 1863 in South Carolina, yeah. was a, a Union Army raid in liberating uh, hundreds of slaves there in South Carolina. So um, she is a, a, an important historical figure who gave so much of her life to the cause and it's good to know her New Jersey ties. Uh, next slide. This is John S. Rock, born in Salem, uh, New Jersey, not as well known, but a rather distinguished person um, who um, studied with two physicians and, and became a dentist and, 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 and medical doctor, as well as a lawyer. This thing, February, almost over. Yes. Jim Scott. Join the meeting. And so uh, John S. My Rock birthday, also, uh, mm. uh, per, uh, uh, um, uh, put a case before the uh, Supreme Court. He wanted to argue on the behalf of black rights, uh, but he was prohibited from doing that because <laughs> of the, the, the uh, Dred Scott decision, which uh, 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 said that blacks are not citizens. So therefore, the court ruled he could not bring suit. But uh, this was a man uh, early on using his expertise in medicine and in law uh, to forward the cause of, of racial justice. And uh, another figure that I would put in here is Thomas Mundy Peterson, the first African American to vote in New Jersey elections uh, in 1870 after the passage of the 15th Amendment. Uh, the, and, the, and it's important to note that New Jersey had banned uh, even free blacks from voting because of an 1807 law and the revised state constitution in the 1840s, mid 1840s, which limited uh, the vote to white males. So Thomas Mundy Peterson, uh, we honor him uh, for hanging in there uh, and exercising the franchise a long time in coming. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Here, I want to talk a little bit about New Jersey origins and the growth of slavery. I run into so many students who are surprised that New Jersey had a long history of slavery. They are further surprised that all of the Northern colonies and Northern states at one time or another had slavery. So slavery was not initially a, a regional institution. It was national, both in American, uh, the American colonial stage and in the, uh, the nation state stage. And I think that's very important because the institution of slavery generated racist attitudes and a racist defense. And those uh, ra racist attitudes were not limited to the South. As we will see, they existed all over the Northern states as well. So although I'm concentrating on New Jersey, uh, it's important to understand that New Jersey 
was in many ways symptomatic of other northern states. In fact, uh, New Jersey and New York were the largest northern slaveholding colonies uh, with an enslaved population of about 8% and 12% respectively. For nearly 200 years, the North maintained a slave labor regime more complex and varied than the South. It wasn't uh, so much plantation agriculture, but the use of Blacks in a variety of, of uh, endeavors, economic endeavors, from skilled craftsmen to use in labor mines, copper mines, uh, uh, working on ship, uh, shipyards, working in docks, and so on. We find the Black presence in the Northeast very, very early. We always associate slavery, of course, uh, beginning in the colonies with Virginia in 1619, right? Uh, that, but it's important to note that soon after that, uh, the Dutch West India Company uh, controlled New York and, and, uh, and spill over into what will later become New Jersey, uh, North Jersey. And the Dutch West India Company settled New York, calling it uh, at that time New Netherlands and New Amsterdam for New York City. And in the mid 1620s began importing Africans. In some cases, they were importing, importing directly from Africa. In some cases, they were raiding um, uh, Spanish slave ships. And so they used the labor of black people to build roads in New Amsterdam, to uh, for, help fortify the forts that they were building there, fearful of attack not only from Indians, but for uh, rival, uh, for, uh, uh, rival uh, colonizing powers like England um, and, and Spain. Uh, and so African labor was essential in New Netherlands. Now, I did it without video. Yeah. Oh, oh can, I'm not. Can we go back to the slide? Yeah, uh, because um, it's important to note that the Dutch went the West India Company did not have individual ownership. They had corporate slavery. These were people that belonged to the company, the Dutch West India Company. Um, now, when the English took over as a result of the uh, Anglo-Dutch War, uh, uh, you will see that. that video. Is Larry? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you will. You will see that uh, the 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 English will introduce individual private ownership of families, but slavery continued to uh, in New York and what became of New Jersey. What became New Jersey once the English took over? Um, so that, that's, I think, important um, to, to understand. Okay, uh, next slide. Now, it's important, too, to, to understand that New Jersey uh, supported its economic development by a policy of importing indentured servants, but also African people. If we look at the first constitution of New Jersey, called the Concessions and Agreement, and this was drafted in 1665, one year after the, the English took over from the Dutch. Now that the Dutch had been the large, one of the largest uh, slave trade uh, shipping industry uh, in the 1600s. So um, if we look at the concessions and agreement in 1665, 
It encouraged slavery. This is the new English constitution for New Jersey by providing land grants. It was called head rights, which really meant 150 acres to colonists bringing in slaves or indentured servants. So uh, this really facilitated English um, um, ownership and exploitation of the land and acquiring the labor to do that. Um, and one of the enticements for people coming over to America and then bringing in, uh, to New Jersey and bringing in people was this idea of the head right system. Okay. Now, if we look at uh, New Jersey, we see that the counties of Bergen, Essex, Monmouth, and Middlesex formed East Jersey. Um, you know, e and, and this East Jersey area constituted 10 to 12% uh, of, of, the, of the black population, of the, of the population of blacks in New Jersey were in these uh, four counties at that time. I should point out that New York City's black population, which was basically Manhattan, and, and we're gonna count Kings County, was about 20% in 1715. So the black population was not minuscule. Certainly it wasn't equal to the Southern colonies. I mean, uh, for example, if we're talking about Virginia, Virginia's population is 40% black on the eve of the American Revolution. and had been holding at that figure maybe since the 1750s. South Carolina had a black majority and as early as 1739. So it's important to note that before we get to the cotton fields of the 19th century America, that America had clearly fastened on to slave labor as early as the 1600s. And certainly by the end of the 1600s, north and south. Now, what's also interesting is there is a stream of uh, African people from the West Indies that will come into New Jersey and also South Carolina because of some changes in the Caribbean. Uh, Barbadian. Um, slave uh, holders, planters, receives huge grants of land in the 1600s, along with slaveholders from New York City to settle in New Jersey. We find uh, Jamaican planter immigrants in the 1700s. Now, one of the things that is happening here in Barbados is we're going to see in the 1700s, it even starts in the latter part of the 1600s, is the conversion from tobacco cultivation to sugar cultivation. And the smaller farmers and planters are brought, bought out by the larger ones. And so what you see is a shrinkage in the number of planters, but great increase in the size of the plantation. In, the, in Barbados, and it happens in other Caribbean islands. So the acreage of the plantations increase, the number of people enslaved on these plantations increase, but the number of planters actually decreases. Where do some of those uh, planters go? They go into South Carolina, into Charleston, and they come in to um, New Jersey, often in New York, and often into New Jersey through ports like Perth Amboy. And we can find some early records of the um, English and, and uh, planters coming in. Uh, for example, one is a fellow called a Colonel Lewis Morris. I don't know why he's a Colonel. Um, uh, perhaps at one time or another, he was in the English Army, who was a Barbadian planter, came to New Jersey and he employed nearly 70 people uh, enslaved in his uh, Shrewsbury Manor. So we, we see this interesting 
uh, and important to note, uh, Caribbean strain coming in. Uh, the next slide is entitled New Jersey Economy and Slavery. And I wanted to give some examples of the types of uh, employment that Black people had, forced employment had in New Jersey, but also uh, to indicate, you know, that it was the, the kind of employment that made folks uh, wealthy or at least well-to-do. For example, a fellow named Charles Reed, R-E-A-D, was an important iron master in Burlington County, and he owned a number of iron forges. And one of his uh, prized possession, possessions was the Andover, oh, there we go, uh, the Andover Iron Works in Sussex County. And this was very, very profitable. Because when I say there was slavery in New Jersey, and it helped to build the American economy, this ex exploitation of black people, people ask, well, there weren't any plantations in New Jersey. They're thinking of cotton tent plantations and tobacco plantations. But there was black people working in agriculture here, uh, not on the huge plantation scene, but they were working in other endeavors. One of them was ironworks in New Jersey. Another was mining in New Jersey. We don't think of mining in New Jersey, but the Schuyler family owned land in Bergen County that contained lucrative copper mines. Uh, blacks were also employed in lead mines in New Jersey <laughs> in the colonial period. Uh, blacks were also employed in the Lambert Ferry in Hunterton County. Uh, and ferries were very important in, in, in getting around and the use of rivers. And, and the use of rivers because the roads were so bad or non-existent. But there were also skilled black craftsmen, some of them enslaved, but some of them who became free. So I want to give maybe a couple of names of these people. Um, the, the West Jersey Quakers, which refers to that to the more or less Southwest part of uh, of. Uh, of uh, New Jersey bordering on Pennsylvania. The West Jersey Quakers encouraged manumission, and I'll get into how that happens. And so a small free black population began to grow in that area. And we can see some of them, well, people like Cyrus Bustill, who opened a successful bakery after obtaining his freedom. Manumission is, is, you get manumission papers or freedom papers. To manumit is to give freedom. Or Caesar Murray, a profitable shoemaker in Burlington County uh, after obtaining his freedom. Um, you know, shoes had to be made, boots had to be made in those, those days. You didn't have mass production of it. Uh, or Peter Hill. Uh, who's very interesting, um, in the same Burlington County, he became a clock and watchmaker and rather renowned. And that was a highly skilled craft. And many of those, once they were able to get their own, uh, their own freedom and they acquire and had this skill and open up their own businesses, they began to purchase their families and relatives and, um, and, and wives, or those that would become their wives, purchase their freedom. Now, Perth Amboy was a significant slave importation port. There was a ceremony there acknowledging that, putting up a Middle Passage marker earlier this year in Perth Amboy. Uh, and there were some 60 sites of importation along the East Coast. We tend to think of only the major cities. You, you think of Charleston uh, in the colonial era, or you might think of DC, or you might think of Boston in New England or New York. 
but there were there were a, there were numerous sites along the eastern seaboard. Uh, next, okay, uh, New Jersey slave control laws and black resistance. I want to talk about this because black people resisted slavery wherever they were, whether in New York, whether in Boston, whether in Charleston, black people are resisting this bondage. And we can see that by studying not only the newspapers, by the laws that they pass to control the black population. So this is just uh, a small fragment uh, limited to New Jersey, but virtually every state north or south, had these laws to control the black population. In 1704, um, the New Jersey uh, legislature passed a law that stipulated and prescribed burning, that is burning at the stake, uh, for people accused of arson or murder particularly black people accused of arson and murder, and, and also castration for interracial sex. Uh, so their, their, their phobias and fears go way back. And, and, and burning people alive was a common practice in a way of, of, of terrorizing people. Now, they, what they were afraid of, and this is, if you think back, all these cities are made out of wood. They're highly flammable. And you can see that in the colonial era, if we look at New York in 1712 insurrection or New York in the 1741 conspiracy, we see black people setting fires <laughs> who want to be free. And so this is, this is, this is a, a fear up and down the East Coast, uh, port cities and, and areas where there is a fear of arson. And in some cases, there are fears of, of, of Blacks in the colonial era. We will see uh, articles in colonial newspapers, like in Charleston, which says, the Negroes have begun the hellish act of poisoning because some slave owners were actually poisoned in Charleston. But let's take a look at how uh, these fears of black resistance are, are all through the colonial press and newspapers and writings of colonial officials. I mentioned the New York conspiracy of 1712 that was put down. No sooner knew the New Jersey legislature, colony next door, right? Mm -hmm will pass a 1730 law, tightening regulation on blacks after this. They also feared the size of the black population. And, and in virtually every slave rebellion or conspiracy to rebel that is discovered and thwarted, the next reaction is to do what? The next reaction is, well, uh, let's limit the size of the black population. The fear that um, the blacks, the more blacks that come in, the larger the, the uh, propensity for rebellion. So what they did in New Jersey in 1730 was to um, institute fees and increase fees in making manumissions or giving freedom to uh, people enslaved more difficult. Now, sometimes that might be um, someone that is the, the, the slave owner that may have some sort of conscience and free someone, or it might be that the purchase of a slave, who's particularly skilled, might acquire a little money to purchase his freedom. But it's very clear they're very much concerned about that. Let's take another uh, perfect example is, is the Stono Rebellion in 1739 in South Carolina outside of Charleston at the Stono River. Uh, 
number of plantation owners were killed before the, the uh, rebellion was put down. No sooner than the rebellion is put down is they pass laws here, not on freeing, but on uh, taxes, not on freeing, but on importing people. Because the English now understand, oh, being a minority and a majority black colony in which the people are enslaved, that's not good for them. And so they think here, profits on one hand, security on the other. So this fear about the um, um, white fear of the size of the black population goes way back. It might be concerned uh, it might be related to why we see some white supremacist organizations so concerned about the fact of the growing black and brown population, black and Hispanic and Asian population and South, Asia, South Asian population in America. Very much concerned about becoming a minority. Um, and we, we can see that these fears are not paranoia. Blacks are dissatisfied, obviously, with slavery and are conspiring. One of the uh, interesting places is, of course, Somerville, New Jersey, uh, uh, 1734 conspiracy, and two of the leaders are hung in a, a public ex exhibition. Um, we go, let's go back to the next slide. I just want to make the point. Now, there's another important one here, barn burning in Hackensack. This is in 1741, Bergen County. Well, in New York, uh, there, there was an alleged conspiracy of Blacks, Indians, some poor whites uh, um, to take over the city, set the city on fire. It, uh, uh, it didn't happen, it was discovered. Many people hung, drawn and quartered. Uh, some sold into slavery in the West Indies, uh, um, uh, others executed. Three barns went up in, in Hackensack, fire in, in, in a blaze. They don't know who said it, the assumption was that Black said it, and there were um, alleged conspirators that were burned alive uh, at the stake, you know, tied to the stake, and burned in Hackensack following uh, the New York slave conspiracy. Southerners, uh, newspapers were, were very much concerned with this. So wherever the colonial newspapers were, they would also be stories about black conspiracies in the Caribbean or, or uh, black rebellions in the Caribbean would be ca carried in uh, American colonial newspapers. Okay, next. Uh, this is John Woolman, 1720, 1752. Uh, he was, uh, that, that their death date is wrong. I have to change this, but like seven years. Uh, but uh, Woolman wrote a track, a pamphlet called Some Considerations on the Keeping of Negroes. He was a Quaker and he had converted to the anti slavery position that some Quakers had. And they were trying to proselytize within their own faith, to convert those within the Quaker faith to abolitionists because Quakers were not initially abolitionists. There were Quaker slaveholders and so forth. So beginning with the Germantown protests, you can go into the next slide. The next. Um, in 1688, this is in Philadelphia. This is the first sort of uh, white abolitionist protest that we see. Uh, and the Quakers signed this petition opposing slavery, saying that um, it was unchristian and immoral. Uh, Will, Woolman uh, will be one of those that will later come after this 
that will become mm -hmm. radicalized to the abolitionist position. And there are a couple of others like Benjamin Lay, John Hepburn. <laughs> begun uh, to, uh, in some meetings, excommunicate their members that held, um, that held slaves. Okay, I see my internet uh, connection unstable. Okay, can't do anything about that. Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about slavery and the American Revolution and its contradictions. If you were to read colonial newspapers on the part of patriots uh, who wanted to rebel against England, or you were looking at their pamphlets, because a lot was done with pamphlets during this time, like Common Sense was basically a large pamphlet. The, uh, the American patriot cause, or revolutionary cause, used a what is called a slavery analogy. That is, they said that the English king and parliament were seeking to enslave them. And this use of the word enslavement regarding their tax dispute with England is common usage. Now, you might look at it as, as political exaggeration, political hyperbole, because they were asked to pay in taxes because the Parliament had incurred debt from fighting wars. Wars always cost money. Nevertheless, the obvious contradiction arises. John Dickinson, who said, those who are taxed without their consent are slaves. Well, they really are. Uh, slavery is a particular brutal system of labor control, and taxes don't constitute that. But nevertheless, the language is not lost on some who recognize the contradiction. So our Reverend Niles in the 1774 sermon writes, for shame, let us either cease to enslave our fellow men or else let us cease to complain of those who would enslave us. In other words, if you are going to rebel and seek independence because of taxation, you can't take away the liberty of other people. So let's talk about uh, what we see leading up to this first emancipation. And the first emancipation is a term that uh, one historian, Arthur Zilversmith, uh, coined. And he's talking about emancipation in the North. And it comes out of the American Revolution. Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Lord Dunmore was the governor of Virginia, a royal governor. And he had um, a, a shortage of troops, he thought, to fight against the uh, revolting colonists. So what he did was to promise freedom, not to all African peoples in Virginia, but to those who were the, uh, um, those that were disloyal to the British crown. He would promise freedom to those that were enslaved by them. And out of this, uh, an Ethiopian regiment uh, occurred. Uh, they refer, called it Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Rev Regiment. Probably most of the people were from West Africa, not East Africa, but anyway. So blacks were taking advantage of whatever would give them freedom. Seeing this, some colonies will allow blacks to enlist or their owners to enlist them with a promise of freedom when the war is over, out of service. Some cases they honored that commitment, some cases they did. But you saw how the British attempt to use uh, uh, blacks in their cause led some Americans 
to want uh, to use blacks in their cause offering freedom. One interesting fellow is a Colonel Ty from New Jersey uh, who had it been, and his name is uh, Titus Corley's, uh, to lead black and white loyalist British ranger groups to attack along the New Jersey coast. And what had, he was enslaved here in New Jersey and he, uh, by, by a Quaker, and, and the Quakers had in, uh, um, that night went to the farm of his owner and tried to persuade him to manumit uh, the people enslaved on his farm, of which uh, Titus was one. He heard the discussion. His owner refused. Titus left and sought a uh, sanctuary with the British and freedom. They gave it to him, and he ended up leading this uh, group um, that raided along the uh, New Jersey coast. And he's well known in um, uh, colonial history, Revolutionary War history circles. Oh, next. Out of this, let me just say, the North would begin to pass uh, gradual abolition laws. They vary. Uh, we find Vermont and Pennsylvania will do so, 1780s, uh, Massachusetts, and New York, 1799. It will occur at different times. New Jersey was the last Northern state to do this. They did this in 1804. And uh, it was the result of the formation of a small but active New Jersey society for promoting the gradual abolition of slavery. Their basic reason was that slavery was uh, immoral and unchristian. Uh, there was a pragmatic reason. The white population in New Jersey was increasing as a result of a great influx of white immigrants. And so black labor was not needed as much in the colony as it had been earlier on in the 1700s and in the 1600s. If you look at the New Jersey abolition law, it's very interesting. It's a gradual and compensated emancipation for slaveholders. I call it reparation, no reparation for those who are enslaved, but reparations for uh, slaveholders, because the slaveholders will get some compensation for those slaves that will become free. The way the law reads is this, those be born before July 4th, 1804 will remain slaves. Those born after July 4th, 1804 will become free on their 21st or 25th birthday. Meanwhile, the slaveholders get the use of their labor. Some abandon the, the young ones, then reclaim them and get money from the state. So it's, it's, a, it's a money making thing. Now, some of these slaveholders, once the law is passed, actually see that they're not going to have uh, uh, slavery as a perpetual thing. It eventually will begin to shrink and die out, even gradually. And they sell people and families and even split up families, selling people into the South after the gradual abolition law. So there is this beginning domestic slave trade, not only from the Upper South, but also from the North into the South. That's what I meant by this abandonment clause. Okay, next uh, slide. Underground Railroad. Well, we covered this and I, I, I want to move on. Let me just say this. There, there is another person that uh, you may recognize uh, in the Harriet film, William Still, uh, who cooperated a lot with Harriet Tubman. He's a real character, historic figure and character. Um, he was a black Philadelphia-based abolitionist, and he did author a great book on, uh, on the Underground Railroad. That's the title of it. 
and it's a wealth of information. And his brother was James Still, known as the Black Doctor of the Pines, um, because of where he lived. And he was a practitioner of uh, folk remedies. Um, we might point out that uh, New Jersey was not such a place of refuge for Blacks uh, fleeing uh, uh, bondage. Certainly the underground routes ran up through New Jersey, branching off into Pennsylvania, branching off into New York, branching up all the way into upstate New York at the New Jersey, New York line up there in Sussex County. But um, um, keep in mind, uh, you had a federal fugitive slave act and um, uh, um, the, the slave owners hired these bounty hunters and they came into states hunting people and taking them back into slavery. And that happened to a number of, of blacks who escaped uh, bondage in the South. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. I want to leave time. Let's talk about, so that was the first emancipation, which gradually in the 1800s made the North um, um, a free state area, even though there were some Blacks, a few Blacks still enslaved in New Jersey, even during the Civil War. A very small number, but they were there. Now, let's talk about um, the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, how it comes about. Lincoln had come under pressure from black abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, white abolitionists like um, William Lloyd Garrison and, and others uh, to issue uh, a directive or proclamation, executive order uh, outlawing slavery once Southern secession began. And he did not because he was fearful of the political fallout, not simply in the South, because they were already seceded, but in the North. And we're going to get into that. And um, so that was one of his concerns, and he hesitated. But in that first year of the war, well, the war did not go well for the Union. They lost uh, a number of important battles in the Eastern Theater. Now, why is that important? I think that's important because Wilson and the, no, Wilson, Lincoln in the spring of 1862 begins to consider maybe manumission, maybe emancipation would help the Union war effort by drawing off soldiers of the Confederate Army back into the plantation areas to control a black population uh, that might defect from the plantations. So he makes up his mind in uh, the spring of 1862 to issue this proclamation, okay? To issue this proclamation. But he doesn't issue it till he can see, can get a military victory because he does not want to appear weak. And then the military victory comes in late August, early September at the Battle of the Antietam in, in, uh, in Maryland. And this is the first attempt on the part of Robert E. Lee to invade the North. Gettysburg was the second failed attempt. But this is highly important. That gives Lincoln this victory that he can uh, um, claim. It doesn't destroy Lee's army at all, but it's a victory. And he issues a preliminary emancipation proclamation. But the preliminary emancipation proclamation is interesting. It states that if the South ends its Rebellion, by January 1, New Year's Day, 1863, they can and come back into the Union 
they can retain slavery. But if they don't, then he, a proclamation will be forthcoming freeing the slaves in the South. I think the reasoning here is very complicated. None of the Southern states take uh, Lincoln up on that. They don't take Lincoln up on that. They don't end their secession and it continues. I don't think he thought that they would end their secession because their armies are not yet decimated to the extent that they will be in 1864. None in their, their rebellion. I think also he's trying to satisfy Northern public opinion in which there is a significant segment of Northern public opinion that is opposed to emancipation. And you can't use present political parties, but I would suggest that the Democratic Party is very much opposed to emancipation. The Northern Democratic Party because Lincoln is condemned for the uh, uh, preliminary emancipation proclamation. And Democrats, like the Democratic governor of uh, New Jersey, had been saying, as the Democratic Party in other northern states had been saying, that if emancipation comes, Blacks are going to flood into the North and take white workers' jobs. Okay. And Governor Joel Parker made numerous statements, uh, and I don't have time to quote all of them, but essentially saying that, and really in some racist language, talking about uh, uh, basically lazy black people coming in to and perambulating, walking around, that will end up on the dole. So he's talking about both sides of the mouth of his mouth. On the one hand, black migrants can come into the state and take all the jobs of white workers, or they're lazy and coming into the state and they're going to end up on the dole or welfare, the, the, the 19th century word for welfare. So there was a lot of hostility. South doesn't end the rebellion, uh, and he issues the Emancipation Proclamation. But what's interesting about the Emancipation Proclamation that's different from the preliminary one is the clause that allows for African-Americans to join the Union Army. And up to that point, African-Americans had not, uh, had volunteered, but were rejected by the Union Army because it said, and, and Northern Press said that this was a war to preserve the Union and not emancipate. I mention this now because very rapidly a transformation of the Union Army will, will, go, will occur. The Union Army will go from virtually 0% Black to 10% Black by the time the Civil War ends in 1865. Think of that. Of the 1,800,000 men that wore the Union blue, 180,000 Blacks served in the Union Army and Navy. We know who they were, we know their names, we know their regiments, we know when they were inducted in and when they were mustered out. Since we're dealing with emancipation, we might talk about the fact that Lincoln lost New Jersey not only in 1860, but also in the 1864 election. Now, I don't want to go in the ins and outs about Lincoln, but what I'm suggesting here is that this represents a backlash against the Emancipation Proclamation on a part of uh, the New Jersey population. And also, we see this in other northern states as well. So I raise this question as why is the state's actual history, its complicated history, so rarely discussed in the public schools. What I'm saying here, um, 
is that during the Civil War, uh, bills were introduced into the New Jersey legislature by such assemblymen as Jacob Vanetta and John B. Perry. They were not passed, but they were uh, introduced, and, it's, and in some cases did pass the assembly, but not the New Jersey Senate, to exclude blacks from migrating into the state. So this fear of a black presence in the state is is this this phobic fear is very real and this hostility to emancipation which is tied to that is very real as well and so um this is a sort of long and torturous road uh, to emancipation but i should say this in conclusion that new jersey voted against the ratification of the 13th Amendment ending slavery, the 14th Amendment um, uh, granting citizenship, birthright citizenship, so making Blacks actual citizens, and that overturning um, uh, 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 the, the Dred Scott decision, and voted against the 15th Amendment. And we saw Thomas Mundy Peterson voting, but his own state voted against it, but fortunately enough states uh, ratified it to become a part of the Constitution. So I thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk about this and uh, and to be a part of uh, POP festivities. Join the meeting. Don for the staff. Thank you, Dr. Green. That was a great lecture. Now we're going to open it up for question and answers and John Brinkley is up to bat. John Stat. Just a couple of quick questions. I got you, John. Okay. Um, I saw that you, that you had that 1804 was that, that slow emancipation in, in Jersey. Um, didn't the Haitian Revolution, or did the Haitian Revolution have some impact on Jersey uh, you know, coming to that decision? And my uh, second question is, um, were there any New Jersey-based banks or insurance companies involved in funding slavery? There might have been. I haven't looked into that part of it. Uh, so there might have been, but I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that insurance companies in other states were involved in slavery so I suspect that they might be, and that is something that would be worthwhile looked at. Now, uh, regarding the Haitian Rebellion, there, there were multiple factors um, involved in, in, uh, in, in abolition. Uh, the Haitian Rebellion um, had differing effects. Obviously, some people felt, well, if you didn't have slavery, you wouldn't have to worry about rebellion. Uh, in the southern states, uh, the Haitian rebellion was uh, had the very opposite effect. Uh, they doubled down on uh, slave patrols. Um, they, they made um, slave um, codes, laws regulating slavery more stringent. They did that after rebellions um, uh, here in, in, in the States, even during the colonial period. So the Haitian rebellion had differing effects. Um, those committed to slavery doubled down on it and became even uh, more vigilant and more repressive. You know, I, um, I taught fourth grade um, and in, in New Jersey, in the fourth grade, students are supposed to learn about New Jersey history. It's a requirement, but none of this information is in the curriculum. And um, you also had a question on why, why is this not discussed in American history? I mean, um, none of it is taught in the schools. Well, I think I think this is because um, local districts, well, there's a couple of reasons. There are some local districts that just don't want to talk about race 
and and America's uh, racist history, uh, and and want to avoid it. Now, th th none of this work that I've mentioned here is particularly new. It's done by university professors over the last 50 to 60 years. So this is basically, we've elaborated on certain points, of course, and expanded on others. But there's a point in which it, it has not come down into the public school curriculum. And, and that's, I think, because of, of attitudes of people. Some people don't want to deal with the topic. Simply put, black history. Now, there's a second reason. Uh, we have the Amistad Commission, and we wrote a New Jersey African American History <laughs> Curriculum Guide back in the 90s uh, on including some of this information. But the bottom line is that the Department of Education has to be willing to push districts on this. You know, uh, to put it on um, skills tests, for example, on social studies tests that people take, um, and and to to mandate this to uh, the the districts, and so you because of this decentralized nature and department of education isn't doing this you find a lot of districts do not do anything to access this information which is readily available yeah i mean you could go to the new jersey historical quarterly or new jersey studies and find a whole bunch of articles i was using the old name of it on this subject um we we mentioned marion thompson wright right? The lecture series. Marion Thompson Wright was a black woman who lived in uh, Montclair, obtained her PhD in history from Columbia, and started writing about the history of blacks in New Jersey in the 1940s. Wow. Pioneer, pioneer work. Uh, we have a new book, uh, uh, and of course, Giles Wright wrote an Afro-American uh, in New Jersey history, good friend of mine involved in establishing Mar Marion Thompson Wright lecture series. His book came out in 1988. Uh, I published my first article, which was uh, uh, in New Jersey history um, in 19... Oh, I'm dating myself. <laughs> no. That's right. Can't remember the date. <laughs> in 1973. New book by Graham Hodge is a very good book, uh, published I think last year in uh, 2019. Yeah, it came out the end of 2019, I think. Black New Jersey. Mm. But there's an awful lot that's just been done, in the, and and they don't access. And see, this is why I think Hannah Hannah Nicole Jones got such uh, 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 flack on the 1619 project. Mm -hmm. Because some of it's new, but a lot of it in there is not new. Uh, but the her her work and publication by the New York Times got such popular attention that pressure was uh, put on districts to say, "Why aren't you dealing with this? Mm -hmm. Right? You know, why aren't you dealing with this?" Well, um, you know. And that's when they started talking about CRT. Seasons for the stats. But 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 um where Larry, what one minute, on. where where can we find information on this? Besides, you know, are, are there any articles or books on African American history in New Jersey? Where can we he, find he just he just gave them, Sharon. <laughs> He just What's gave it? me three books. He just named the them. title. The title. Uh, well, He's Graham Hodges, who teaches at Colgate, uh, is called Black New Jersey. Okay, pay attention. And it goes from the colonial times up to the present. Okay. Uh, there is another. Um, I. I wrote a book, a uh, thing called the Journal of the Rutgers University Libraries. It's the whole issue of the journals, about 70 mm -hmm. pages on the history of blacks in New Jersey. And that yeah, was uh, joined the meeting in 1994. Right, and uh, and of course, I mentioned Giles Wright, Afro-American 
African Americans in New Jersey. And he was the director of the Afro American program for the New Jersey Historical Commission. Okay, and, he, and it's it's a great it's a it's a great book, uh, the late uh, Giles Wright, uh, and you might be able to get this through the New Jersey Historical Commission. And Thank you very much. And Clem Price, everyone knows Clem Price, right? Yes. Uh, the late Clem Price. His book, uh, Freedom Not Far Distant. You can probably, I don't, it may not be in, 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 um, it, it, it may not be impressed, but probably all the libraries have it in New Jersey, Freedom Not Far Distant. It is a collection of primary source documents, primary source documents from the period. Uh, and, uh, and that's out there and uh, probably in the local libraries and college libraries and uh, major public libraries, Newark, Trenton, all of those, you can get it in, in a library loan. Um, I have an article here on the Civil War and Reconstruction in this, um, this is called New Jersey History, New Jersey, A History of the Garden State, New Jersey, A History of the Garden State, different chapters by different people, Maxine Lurie, L-U-R-I-E, is the editor, uh, she's the president uh, chair of the board, of the New Jersey Historical Commission and Richard Veit at Monmouth College. These are the editors and different people have written, uh, you know, different, different chapters. I wrote the one on the Civil War and Reconstruction uh, in here. So there, there is there, well, there's there a lot is, of information out there. Yeah. Yes. And, and so I think if you're looking for this kind of information to sort of provide historical background for your work, this is a great starting point um, to talk about that. Um, yeah. uh, also, um, Deborah Gray White has done some great work uh, on a book, and I was just looking for it, so I may, may have it uh, either in my office, I'm at home. Uh, it's called The Scarlet and Red. It's sort of like a history of the relationship between Rutgers University and, and slavery. Wow. Okay, and I don't know. I'll I'll look for it if I uh, I'll get I'll the precise title and get it to you. But it's uh, Deborah Grave White, right, African American sister, very brilliant woman, teaches at Rutgers, uh, New Brunswick, and she's been there for years. She's written a great book. Uh, where is uh, Aren't I a woman? A classic. Um, Female Slaves in the Plantation South. She's also done one, a book on uh, African American club women. Hmm? Right. All right, Susan. Ask, ask question. Question. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you. Ask Thank you. I asked first. Go ahead, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dr. Green. Happy, happy, happy Black History Month. Thank first you. Of all, Dr. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you being here with us. Yes. I have, a, I have some, some interesting questions for you, just two of them. First of all, what do you really think about the, the um, critical race theory? Do you think critical race theory, uh, what do you think about it, first of all? And the second question, what made you become a Black history teacher? Third is, do you think that black history, studying black history, learning about your history does make uh, our African-American people better people um, or, or something else? Because you, you, I, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of this, I see uh, other races and how they stick together and how they're together and they don't talk about their history as much, but we gotta also look at the situation that they did not come over here um, with the same baggage that we came over here. We came over here as slaves. They came to me more of a family unit. So I think they were definitely ahead of the eight ball than we were because I'm just seeing so many things around me now that I, I question these things, Dr. Green is saying that, you know, a lot of people say, is all that black history really necessary or these black people really need to be putting some more money in their pocket? Can you help me? 
Yeah, well, I, I certainly don't believe that it's about putting more money in the pocket. I think black history is very important to understanding American history. And if you don't have any understanding of African American history, Native American history, Hispanics and Asians, and the role they play, then you have a very distorted version of American history. Because all these people were there, all of them uh, had input uh, and, and helped shape American history. So I think that's very, very important. Now, uh, how I became interested in history was one of your questions. Uh, my mother was a, a school teacher. She taught in the school system at Orange and began Black History Month there. So that's how I got interested in that. My mother attended a historically Black college, uh, Livingstone College in North Carolina. That's where my folks are from, that particular state. Uh, although I grew up here in New Jersey in a graduate of East Orange High. Okay. So I grew up in the area, but I grew up around uh, uh, people. Uh-oh. Going out again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, celebrations and started that. Uh, 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 as a fifth grade school teacher in Orange. Um, now, the, the critical race theory. You know, critical race theory started out as something that uh, Derek Bell and some others, particularly in law school, were talking about institutional racism. But, you know, as historians, we've been talking about racism uh, ever since African American historians started writing about the Black experience. So um, when I talk about American racism, it's not a theory, it's, it's a reality. <laughs> documented. It can be documented. So I think when some of these people use this, this is just a right wing buzzword uh, because they really don't want to talk about black history. And if you don't want to talk about black history, as far as I'm concerned, then you don't want to talk about a real version of American history because the black experience is inextricably intertwined. It's, in, it's there, it's intertwined with American history as is all ethnic history in America. And so I think th that it's very important to know um, what shaped American history. And I think that that, um, that that is very important to understanding who you are and where you're located in society. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that, then you can't anticipate uh, what may come your way, whether it's good or bad. Uh, it's important to kind of be able to anticipate and develop plans to deal with this, uh, this stuff. Um, I, I had one, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I'm sort of bi-regional. In that, I was born in uh, New Jersey, lived in East Orange, uh, uh, born in uh, Columbus Hospital in Newark, <laughs> okay? If you remember mm -hmm. Columbus Hospital back there. Yep. Yep. But my parents always shipped me off to my aunt and uncle in North Carolina because they were childless, and so I was sort of their uh, adopted child, even though biologically related. And I would be now. Why that's important is that I had an opportunity to grow up in a sort of halfway integrated North, like New Jersey, halfway integrated, you could say. Uh, but I also had an opportunity to grow up in a segregated South, even though I only was there as a child during those years. But I every summer for about 12, 14, 15 years. Uh, I was there in the South. So I remember riding in the back of the bus. I remember the colored and white signs. I remember going to uh, the movies and my cousin, who was a you know, native North Carolinian, born and raised there. And I started to go and sit on the main floor. You know, no, we got to go Join upstairs. Why we got to go oh. upstairs? I asked. Well, oh. That's where there's a colored section. So I began to think, you know, why is that so? Okay. And then I saw these monuments in the town of Salisbury, North Carolina. And, and I'm, I'm seeing, okay, this is a, 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 a monuments to Civil War soldiers. 
but they're all Confederate soldiers. They didn't see any <laughs> monuments to Union soldiers. Certainly didn't see any monuments to the Massachusetts 54. Why is that so? So I, I guess I got that inquisitive mind. But let me just say, you know, we, we talk about Carter G. Woodson as the father of, uh, uh, you know, Black History Month, week and then later month, and we need to make it 12 months out the year. He started the Association for Negro Life and History, now African American Life and History, in 1915. The Journal of Negro History began publication in 1916. Wow. 1916. Wow. Right now, the Association for the African American Life and History is an organization that he founded. He received his PhD from Harvard, by the way, a few years after Du Bois. Um, he started the Journal of, Af of, 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 of Negro History, you know, Journal of African American History. If you look at the way that the uh, historical profession has moved to stop teaching about happy slaves on the plantation. That revision isn't new. It began in, with the black historians even before white historians. Black historians were in the forefront of this change. Um, so it's important that we continue to support journals like this and associations. Every October they have a conference. Uh, it, it, it's, it's important. The, the groundwork that people like he did and John Hope Franklin and Rayford Logan and all these black historians, uh, um, so many of them attached to historically black colleges, Benjamin Quarles at Morgan State. Uh, these were real pioneers in the field, turning out really great history when the American historical profession wasn't. Now the American historical profession has caught up to where black historians have always been. Wow. <laughs> who who uh, is next on the stack? Larry. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, um, Daniel, too. Thank you for a great presentation, Professor thank Green. You. You, you raised almost tongue in cheek. Why don't they talk about this history in, in schools in New Jersey? And Sharon raised the same question. Well, I taught fourth grade. Why didn't they teach it? We got to understand what schools are. They're ideology factories for the subsequent generations to pretend to maintain or to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. We live in a white supremacist society and they don't want history. They want mythology that yeah. supports white supremacy. That's mm -hmm. why they don't teach this in our schools. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of on the ground, the population has changed. You are no longer enslaved. And Carter G. Woodson and company said, if you educate a Negro, what? you're going to have a mad Negro on your hands. <laughs> so they're not going to teach us. I just wanted to say, I think Ingrid has forwarded it, but uh, Brother Abdullah Kalimat, who is a Black Studies pioneer also, sent out a, uh, compilations of Afro-American history in many fields. And Ingrid can help you if you say, where can we get some more of this information? Mm -hmm. That compilation by Abdul was sent out. If not, it can be sent out and would be helpful to them. But yes, it's about it, it comes down to social control. That's yeah, why it's yeah. not in the history. Yeah. He's a very, very, very good scholar. I had the pleasure of meeting him through uh, Brother Bill Sales years ago. <laughs> <laughs> very great yeah. scholar. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Daniel, you had your question. Okay. I got, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I had, well one thing I'm going to say about the school system. You know, I've been teaching, I taught for maybe two decades. One thing, uh, you know, the school in New Jersey, they have like a contractual mind where they build, the, they buy their textbooks from, from Texas. Texas, they 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 the main uh, uh, drivers of the other other school textbooks, and you know Texas, te te no Texas is definitely southern southern racist minded state, right? And they and the teachers make their lesson plans 
based on the textbook. Right. So, 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 when the white New Jersey didn't do know why? Because they found the textbook. So, if we want to make the 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 Amish start thing something, we got to somehow make it somehow in the New Jersey legislature, which they had to include some of the books that you talking about in the textbook. Otherwise, teachers ain't gonna do it. But they ain't gonna yeah. find the time, and and they don't want to be written up. Yeah. So, 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 then, okay. Now, the other thing is this thing here. You know, you may not know, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Green, but I do know that the Civil War is my thing. <laughs> now, I don't know whether you, because this is a short note, but you can, but you can have, but you can have you speak in April, or maybe next year you can do a thing. We like to have you definitely do a public thing, if not this year, next year when, when, when we do the march. Mm-hmm. If, we, if you ain't know it or not, Pop been commemorating this every April, the mm-hmm. Civil War. And you're yep. now, we would, we would definitely appreciate you. Uh, if you can't do nothing this minute, next year when we do the march, we would definitely appreciate your company. All okay. right. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Who, who else was on the stack? I Anybody see. else? I see a hand, Susie. Uh, yeah, I didn't read it. Is that Brother James Harris there? My yeah. colleague? That's yep. him. This is James Harris, Larry Green. Hey, my, <laughs> my <laughs> alum. I just, got, I, I just got off another meeting, but I said I've got to see my colleague and see if he is telling stories about Lou Zimmer in that <laughs> world history course. <laughs> no, I didn't get to Lou on this one. <laughs> uh, how are you, Jim? I am always glad to see you, and I'm doing well, thank you. I'm blessed. Good, good, good. Thank Ma- you for your scholarship. Yeah, uh, uh, Jim and I were in the trenches at Montclair State as undergraduates, yeah, undergraduate wow. social studies majors, so we were... Mm. We've been laboring in the vineyards a long time, right, Jeff? <laughs> Sharon, yeah. um, Sharon, I have one more thing I want to say about you. Got the, you I, got the last question, yeah, Brian. It's <laughs> probably a, I, I, I te- I'm teaching sixth and seventh graders in English language arts, and I teach Black history every year. And um, you know, this is the first year where I feel like I'm under scrutiny in some way. Um, because of the CRT um, discussion, you know, in America right now. But I asked my students um, last week, um, you know, what they want to learn about Black history. None of them could could even give me a question. So I asked them, I said, well, do you know anything about slavery? Most of them didn't know. They don't, sixth and seventh graders don't know about slavery in America. How can that be? How can that be? They yeah. are not taught. Yeah. And it's the decentralized nature of, of uh, education in America. Unless I know. you are lucky enough to be in a progressive school district willing to select books, there are textbooks that are decent for high school, junior high school, elementary school that will deal at that level with race in and, and American history. But you got to be in a district that wants to do that, wants to go and do the work, find those books, and 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 select them, and and find the lessons plans, because there are lesson plans out there and resources. Uh, well, if, I have if, the lesson you, plans. If, I have the lesson. To. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, Sharon, let him finish. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. But, but I have the lesson plans, uh, but Patterson, I teach in Patterson Public Schools. Uh, it is an Amistad district, so that's not the case. I think it's also the teachers that these students have had. They, yeah. they have, social studies is, has been in the curriculum. Black history is, black history is American history. They should know about certain parts of American history. And yes. so I'm, I'm, I told them I was going to, you know, do as and much. And you're in the I Patterson did. School District. Yeah. How is the mayor doing there? The mayor? About, yeah. what, doing, about what? For what? 
Uh, is he involved in um, the, what's um, going um, on educationally? Not from what I see, no. Yeah. Not from Andre? Yeah, I, I, he might be. He might be. Uh, uh, okay. Have... The only reason I ask is uh, I taught him. So <laughs> I'm going to give him a call, find out what he's doing, because he sat in my African-American history class. <laughs> what was your mother's te uh, your mother's name in orange her, her, as a her, teacher? Her name was Valley Green, V-A-L-I-E. Oh. And she taught at Park Avenue Elementary School. Mm -hmm. uh, she was an English major in, in college, actually, but uh, she ended up teaching in elementary school. And and uh, she made a difference, and uh, that that's uh, I owe obviously a lot to my to my parents and 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 my mother, uh, yeah. So um, education is so important in what you do, and I know it's a struggle. We just have to keep uh, keeping at it. Well, I have the books. I have the materials. Well, so that's not the issue. I, I'm gonna. I teach it every year. I teach Black History every year. Yeah. Well, Dr. Green, we want to thank you. You yeah. made a difference tonight. <laughs> you gave okay, us a you. lot of information. I I learned some things tonight. Mm -hmm. I, you you held my you held my attention there. You know, yes. and uh, you know what I would draw. One of the things I would draw from your uh, discussion tonight is how pro-slavery this northern state of New Jersey was. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't even like a little bit. It was like a whole lot, you know. <laughs> you know, to hear that laws were passed to prevent Black people from migrating to New Jersey. Now, that I hadn't heard. And I hadn't heard the law about castration. I hadn't heard that. You know, I mean, there was, there was some things that you uh, put out here tonight that were brand new for me. And and I I've read a little bit about the history of New Jersey, but I I definitely learned some things tonight. So we want to, on behalf of People's Organization for Progress, we want to thank you. And I think Daniel is right. We're gonna have to have you come back. Uh, we think that uh, ex examination of the Civil War is essential. You yes. you really can't understand what's going on in America right now this day in the 21st century, unless you understand the Civil War, Reconstruction, and post-Reconstruction. Yes. Very and, much. Uh, and so thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if um, you're able to, but if somehow you could give us a set of, of the, I mean, if you want to, I'm just saying, if you provide us with a set of your slides, we'll send it out electronically. To mm -hmm. people, because that's some, what you put out tonight was some information that um, really people people need to have. You know, well, I'll, have I'll, <laughs> I'll, you know what? I I will do that. Just you know, give me a little time. I want to correct some typos on the slide that I saw, <laughs> some misspellings, and I will also include a bibliography of. Uh, works that I think, and it won't be long, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a mixture of old and new that's really, uh, really great that I think will be, you know, beneficial uh, to, to everyone so that, you know, the more information uh, that we can get out, the better, and I'll be glad to do it. And I really appreciate you uh, inviting me here, and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we, thank we you. We will too. be calling upon you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.